So welcome everybody and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we do appreciate you taking this extra step to be prepared to hike on the Appalachian Trail in 2021. My name is Catherine Herndon Powell. Um, I work for ATC in our Virginia Regional Office based out of Roanoke, Virginia. Uh, my role, my title is Education and Outreach Coordinator, so I get to do lots of cool stuff with teachers and kids on the trail, as well as working with our designated AT communities, which we'll be talking a little bit about coming up, and uh, the trail clubs that maintain the trail and volunteers. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Drew and then Stephen to tell us who they are. Hi, everyone. My name is Drew Falco. I also work for ATC. I am the Appalachian Trail Community program coordinator. So I'm the main contacts for all of our designated trail communities all along the trail. I'm helping build capacity for that program. And really excited to be talking to you all today about resupply strategies and what, um, how you can keep safe when you're going into town. Now I'll pass it over to Stephen. Thank you, Drew. How y'all doing today? My name is uh, Stephen Aaron. I'm the Trail Facilities Manager out of Asheville. I get to help set up volunteers and other different folks up for success in uh, Georgia, North Carolina, and Tennessee. Um, yeah, so it was, it's great. And thank you guys for taking time out of your day to learn a little bit about um, the old Appalachian Trail. Let me pass it back to the specialist, KHP. Thanks, Stephen. Sorry, a little too much coffee today. I'm, I'm sorry. About that. <laughs> I, could, I couldn't tell at all. <laughs> It's kind of uh, Stephen's energy on a, on a normal day anyway. Um, yeah, and I see that there are definitely some folks on here that I've seen on some of these, uh, some of the info sessions that we've done prior. This is, wow, I'm losing count, but there's 15 um, info sessions. We started them back in December. So um, the next 15 minutes or so is going to sound a little repetitive if you've uh, attended another one or if you've been watching them on YouTube. Um, and for anybody who wa who's watching this recording on YouTube later, you are welcome to just jump ahead about 15 minutes um, because we're first going to go over our basic uh, kind of overview information for things um, we think everybody should know if they're planning a long distance hike on the trail this year. And then we will pivot to uh, talking about resupply strategies and going a little more in depth on that topic. So um, if you're with us live and you've already seen this, you know, feel free to just like take your, your bio break or whatever you need to do <laughs> until we get to the, to the special theme for today. Uh, and so right off the bat, I do just wanna say um, a few things about COVID-19 pandemic we've all been living through. Um, if you've been following ATC's communication at all from the beginning of the um, pandemic through today, uh, you know that we did ask everyone to postpone their long distance hikes in 2020 and the pandemic is still ongoing. Um, CDC guidance has not changed relating to you know, traveling. And so um, we also haven't changed our guidance. Hiking is a form of interstate travel, which makes it a public health risk. So the safest thing for all hikers and for the communities that they pass through would be for everyone to continue to put off their long distance hiking plans and stay local and recreate locally. Um, we do continue to monitor the situation in all 14 states, and we hope for great news coming down the pike, but until there is an effective, widely available vaccine or treatment for COVID-19, um, and the CDC deems the pandemic to be under control, we are not going to be encouraging long-distance hikes or re recognizing them with 2,000-miler certification. So, if you haven't been to one of these before, you might be wondering, why are we hosting a session for, uh, with advice for long-distance hikers if we are discouraging long-distance hiking? Well, it does appear that people are still going to go on long hikes in 2021. And we know that the folks who do make that choice uh, want to be ready in all the ways the hikers always want to be ready, as well as uh, taking extra precautions for this paradigm. So ATC, we find ourselves in a unique position to reach people who are planning a long distance hike with information that we hope will help minimize the risk of COVID-19 transmission and outbreaks along the Appalachian Trail and among hikers and communities. So ATC hosting these sessions does not mean that it's safe or advisable to through hike in 2021. It means that we are determined to do everything we can to minimize the risk. All right, now that we've got that out of the way, let's dive into a little bit of background about the Appalachian Trail, just in case y'all don't know this stuff. The trail itself is 2,193.1 miles. The distance of the trail does shift a little bit uh, year to year as we do relocations in different places. It, stretches uh, from Georgia to Maine, from Springer Mountain, which is a southern terminus, up to Katahdin, the northern terminus in Maine. It passes through 14 states, six national parks, 
eight national forests and a whole bunch of other types of uh, state lands as well and different other types of public lands along the way, but primarily the national parks and the national forests. Um, we do have an estimate that there are three to four million visitors annually. It's hard to get a really hard number because there are so many access points on the trail. It's very porous, it goes through 14 states. Uh, and that doesn't take into account the sort of COVID bump. Uh, we've been seeing like 200% of normal visitation in a lot of um, places, especially those places that are more easily accessible to day hikers uh, and closer to metropolitan areas because of course outdoor recreation is one of the safer things to do during the um, pandemic. How is the trail managed? It is maintained, managed, and protected through the cooperative management system. That was a lot of big words. The cooperative management system is uh, a partnership between 87 distinct land managers. So that's the, all the different units of the National Park Service and the National Forests and all those state lands um, and other types of public land. Uh, 31 trail maintaining clubs. So that's the cool map that's up on your screen there on the right. It shows all the logos of those 31 clubs with little lines pointing to the sections of the trail. So you'll see that every single mile of the trail is maintained by a local trail club. Um, some of the clubs are bigger than others um, they're, and they're all just really unique and different. It's so cool uh, to get to work with all these different organizations. But the main thing you should know is that they're volunteers and that they are doing the day-to-day -day heavy lifting, boots on the ground work to keep the trail open and safe and maintained. And of course the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. So we are the national nonprofit that coordinates the whole effort, um, supporting those local volunteers, uh, working with our land management agencies to make sure all of, of the agreements are in, in line and everybody's got everything they need to be working safely and training and standards are the same and all that kind of stuff. All right, and I just can't say it too often that the trail is maintained by over 6,000 volunteers on a normal year. Of course, during COVID times, that number of hours and number of volunteers did go down because volunteers were not able to go safely um, out to maintain the trail. But when you look at folks like me and Drew and Steven that get to uh, support the trail as our careers, we're really, really lucky, but we are a tiny, tiny bit of the effort compared to the volunteers that are doing most of the heavy lifting. So if you ever see a volunteer on the trail, please do thank them. And an even better thing to say would be, how can I help? Maybe you wanna join a trail crew or they may, they may just wanna want your help lifting something heavy or what it may, whatever it may be. Okay, when we talk about long distance hiking on the trail or hiking at all on the trail, uh, I'm gonna borrow one of Steven's cool catchphrases. There's a lot of ways to dig this cat hole. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna be talking a lot about through hiking. So just so that we're all using the same terminology, a through hike is, a, is completing the entire trail, 2,193.1 miles in 12 months or less. It doesn't have to be within one cal calendar year, but a 12 month period. Northbound through hike is going from Georgia, from Springer Mountain, continuously north until you get to Katahdin. Southbound is the reverse, starting up at Katahdin and going continuously down to Springer. A flip-flop hike is starting anywhere in the middle and doing a section and then coming back and doing another section, still completing it in uh, 12 months or less if you are a through hiker. Um, there's a lot of advantages we'll talk about in a moment of doing a flip-flop hike, especially right now. The most traditional way to do a flip-flop hike is to start at Harper's Ferry, which is the psychological halfway point of the trail, and of course where the headquarters of ATC is. It's also pretty easy to get to um, because there's a train right from DC, and just a really cool kind of iconic location on the trail. Uh, there's also section hiking, and so section hiking is completing the entire trail in anything more than 12 months. <laughs> so that could be, um, you know, some people do it over the course of two or three years, and they might call themselves a lasher, a long ass section hiker. Um, other folks can take, you know, they just can only do 100, 200 miles a year, and it might take them 20 or 30 years to do it. So there's lots and lots of different ways to dig that cat hole as well, to be a section hiker. And then of course there's day hiking. So day hiking would be anytime that you're not actually sleeping on the trail, um, and probably your goal is not to uh, complete the whole thing. All right, so now that we are all speaking the same language, I want to first make sure that I'm securing my sound. Here we go. 
and I'm going to play some groovy music for y'all. And we're going to take, I'm going to set a little timer for 30 seconds. And I'd like everybody to reflect when I say go on what your desired experience is. Um, now that you've shared your, your plans for hiking, uh, think about what it sounds like, what it smells like, what's a beautiful day on the trail look like and feel like, what are you looking for? Looks like we just got people looking for an excuse to quit their job. <laughs> yeah, and to be miserable and in pain for a couple months, that sounds like a through hike to me. Uh, connect with nature, sitting around a fire at the end of the day. I hear that one. All right, great. Well, we just would invite you to, um, as I go through the next couple slides, you know, keep that desired experience in mind as we think about um, the realities of uh, the trail, especially in different different choices you might make about where you start. So here's a um, chart showing through hiking through the years. Uh, the top reddish orange line is through hiking through hiker starts in Georgia. I always like to ask if anybody knows why we had that big old bump in 1997-98. Um, so I'll let y'all guess about that in the chat. And while you're doing that, interpret you know the um, the green line is the actual through hike completions that were reported to ATC through that 2000 mile certification process. Uh, and just for the past four years, five years, since we started the um, AT camp registration system that I'll talk about in, the mo in a moment, uh, we've, had, we've been tracking flip-flop hikers as well. And of course the um, blue line at the bottom would be the southbound hikers. So anybody guessing, you can let me know, Steven or Drew, any good guesses in the chat about that 98, 97 bump? Tammy is close. Brian is correct. It is the Bryson bump. The Bryson bump, yes. A, a Walk in the Woods, uh, the book, before we had the movie, uh, the, the book came out in 96. And of course, that's kind of when through hiking as a phenomenon became more a part of uh, popular culture. But you can also see that while it did drop off after that Bryson bump, ever since around 2007, 2008, uh, which we always see a, a little increase when there's economic downturn, Folks seem to have the time to cross things off their bucket list. Um, but it's been steadily climbing to the point where over the past few years, it's not at all unusual to have 4,000 people starting um, in Georgia. And they're all trying to start within about a you know, six to eight week period in March and April. So a few things to consider as you're thinking about what itinerary you might choose, where you might want to start. Uh, terrain, that's a picture of the climb up to Cotton. Um, if you start out going southbound, you are starting on the very hardest climb of the whole entire trail. Uh, you're going to be going hand over hand in places. And then um, as you head into Maine, especially southern Maine and the whites, you are really taking on the most challenging section of the trail when you don't yet have your trail legs um, and you, you may not quite be as prepared for it. Um, then, then if you were considering a southbound hike, you want to think about crowding. This is a picture that is not at all unusual from a, a shelter in the Smokies at the Tri-Corner Knob a few years ago on, of course, a cold rainy day. You can see some folks um, actually are trying to sleep on the floor of the shelter that's not uh, even supposed to be uh, part of the sleeping headcount there. And everybody's got their stuff hung up everywhere. So you can see that this is not an ideal situation in COVID times. That's part of why ATC is recommending that you do not use the shelters, whether or not they're officially open or closed. Um, but when the weather gets yucky, uh, this is going to happen. And um, also weather. So there's a little bit of a misconception out there that if you are coming from the north or from a colder climate, that Georgia sounds like south. It's going to be so warm. <laughs> and North Carolina and Tennessee, it is not warm because of the elevation um, and the great big beautiful mountains that we have in the deep south. Um, so whether it's March or it's May, it's not at all unusual to have snow in the Smokies and some really unpleasant hiking conditions if you're not prepared for some extreme winter weather. So flip-flopping again is a way to start out uh, in, you're starting out farther north, but you actually have milder weather um, in the spring. Uh, and, and I just want to touch on Leave No Trace. We're not going to die. I can talk for hours about Leave No Trace. I did for the past couple days. <laughs> it's like it's my job. I love it. Um, so I'm not going to let myself get too deep into these. But just a few things to mention, uh, of course, is uh, please be prepared to dig a cat hole six to eight inches deep. 
and 200 feet away from water and campsites and trails, uh, which 200 feet for most folks is somewhere in the range of 70 to 100 steps. So it's, I find it easier to count my steps as I go to know that I've gone a good distance. Um, again, because the, we're not recommending anybody use the privies right now during um, COVID times. It's always important for hikers to have a travel and know how to dig a cat hole, but this year it's extra important that we're all really going that 200 feet and digging those uh, textbook six to eight inches cat holes so that no one's going to be digging it up later. And by no one, I mean the wildlife, not your fellow hikers. And of course, also food storage is very important. Um, so you have some options. We most highly recommend using a bear canister. Uh, that, that other picture of the bag is a ursac. If you're gonna use one of those instead of a canister, um, they are, you know, some, some models are certified bear resistant, but please make sure you know how to tie the knots correctly. There's a lot of room for user error in using an ursac. And of course the third option down, if you um, don't have a canister or an ursac, you can hang your food at night so please learn how to do the PPC method and make sure you've really got it 12 feet off the ground and six feet down from the trunk and six feet out from, yes, down from the branch above it and out from the trunk. That whole, you got it. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen, for the visual aid. Um, all right, and we are really recommending asking everyone, everyone to register your hiking plans at atcamp.org. ATCamp is our uh, voluntary registration system. We have in the past primarily used it for groups and for through hikers registering their starting date and location. And we do want um, those folks to keep using it. We're also asking everyone to use it regardless of where you might be starting on the trail. So if you're doing a flip-flop hike, uh, if you're doing a section hike, the more people use AT Camp to indicate where they're gonna be, the more helpful it is for, for the next person coming along to be able to see how many people are starting on a given date. If you're registering for a through hike, you don't have to say where you're camping every night. You can just say what day you plan to start and where you plan to start. So this, it, you can find on our website, um, this chart also, you can, you can find it and kind of customize it when you get into atcamp.org uh, to look at different sites and different dates. But the red line represents the capacity of the campsites in the area. So when we get above the red line, that means there's gonna be a lot of crowding at the campsites and you may not be able to find a good tent site um, and you're, you're just going to be dealing with a whole lot of people around you in your campsite at night. So you can see from this report, which was from February 10th, uh, that most of the spring, we are already above that red line um, for folks starting in Georgia and McCullough Falls. So uh, that's just something to keep in mind as you plan. Great if you can look at these charts and then pick out a date um, where you're not getting over that line. A few pro tips for using AT Camp: um, check the charts first. Uh, be aware that a regi re registration is not a reservation. It does not mean that you have a spot. Uh, you still need to get your permits for the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in Shenandoah and Baxter. It's just a tool so we can all try and spread ourselves out over space and time. Um, and you can't change your registration. So if your plans change, you're going to have to cancel the old one and create a new one. So we do recommend. Uh, you know, bookmarking, saving the email that you're going to get once you register because you'll need the registration number in order to cancel your registration. Uh, and it is easier to do on a laptop, but you can do it on a phone, especially if you're just trying to do a, a simple um, through hike start date registration. Okay, a few things about safety. We're going to breeze through this pretty quickly because we'll be getting more into food supply in a moment and COVID safety, um, just always listen to your gut. If you're in a situation that doesn't feel right, you know, listen to that sensation and, and move on if you can. Uh, if you are aware of any incidents, there is an um, incident report form on our website and we, the more we hear about it, the more we can help uh, and, and have a good picture of what's going on. So please be familiar with the incident report form. There's also a uh, 24 hour phone line you can call that the park service for reporting incidents as well. If it's a 911 emergency, call 911. And it, we're talking more about incidents like uh, resource damage, somebody's making somebody feel uncomfortable on the trail, but not necessarily like I'm going to call 911 about it right now. Um, share your itinerary with someone back home and make sure you check in with them regularly and that they have a, a realistic expectation of how often you're going to check in. So uh, you want someone to be worried if they don't hear from you for a certain amount of time, but you also shouldn't have have them expecting to hear from you at times when you may be out of cell phone service or your cell phone battery might die, things like that. 
So usually checking in every few days is more um, realistic than checking in daily, but you want someone to know where you are if they, and, and where to go looking if they uh, did not hear from you. Um, and for that reason, it's a great idea if you can to carry a satellite communication device, such as a spot device or a, or a um, inreach, Garmin inreach device, because that works even when you don't have cell phone service. Just a word about firearms. A lot of folks carry firearms because they are worried about um, wildlife, bears, uh, or other people. Uh, but there is there's a lot of practical things to consider if you're going to carry firearms, such as do you have um, all the right permits for all the different jurisdictions you're going to pass through, the different types of federal land and state land through all the 14 states, and are you going to be able to secure it at night? It's a lot of weight. So most folks um, find that it's a little easier to consider something like bear spray or pepper spray uh, to have that way to defend yourself if needed. And always a good idea to stay on top of weather forecasts and hazards. Uh, I like the AT weather shelter campsite that I'm, I'm blanking on the exact name of it. Maybe Steven can put it in the chat as a, as a way to check in when you're in town. Um, but always be looking overhead for hazards like dangling branches and dead trees around when you set up your campsite. PPE stands for Personal Protective Equipment. That's a uh, you know acronym that a lot more folks are using these days. Oh, we got masks from from the plant, Drew. All right. <laughs> I, I hear keys, right. keys keys going fiercely all over the, the the country right now. Tammy Barnes, hand sanitizer, correct, Tammy? Yes. Okay. Good. So yes, always have your um, face coverings, your your mask. It's great to have a spare one that stays clean in your in your first aid kit in case you have to give somebody first aid. They might not have a mask. But also, and the hand sanitizer, absolutely. Uh, also, your personal shelter is part of your personal protective equipment this year uh, because it will keep you from being tempted from sleeping in, inside a shelter where you would be sharing airspace with someone, well, a bunch of people potentially all night long who are not part of your household. Uh, and also, you know, the more you can stay out of shelters, the better, even during, you know, the middle of the day for a lunch break and stuff. If it's yucky weather, you can throw up a tent or a tarp, whatever you may be sleeping in. And of course, your trowel so that you don't uh, set foot in those germ covered privies and your hand washing uh, kit and hand sanitizer. And then um, we're going to talk a little more about resupply and town visits, go more in depth on it later on, so I'll skip over that. And also going to skip over this transportation part here, and I already talked about AT camp, but just do be aware that regulations vary relating to where dogs are allowed, where camping is, uh, and campfires are allowed, and of course food storage, so you need to be um, educated as you go about what the local regulations. Uh, you do need permits for the Smokies, uh, for Shenandoah and Baxter. If you're going northbound, the Smoky Mountain National Park is the only one of those um, permits that you would want to get in advance. Uh, and the latest you would want to get it is maybe Nantahala Outdoor Center uh, because they do have issues with internet connectivity and access um, at, at uh, Fontana. So I wouldn't wait that late. Last thing before I pass it over to Drew for our theme of the day. Uh, just a little bit about gear. There's tons and tons of great information out there, so we won't go real in depth. Um, but the, it's best to spend most of your energy in terms of researching and, and trying to figure out what works best for you, as well as your money on the big three, your backpack, um, your sleeping system. So that's your, uh, you know, your sleeping bag or quilt and your uh, sleeping pad and your shelter. Those are the places where if you spend a little extra, you're gonna have a, a possible uh, quality and weight savings. So aim for no more than generally like about three pounds each if you can. Can't say it too many times, carry that travel, uh, carry your food storage system, bear cans recommended. Always cool to look for used gear if you're looking to save money. Um, carry that COVID-19 PPE and shoot for a fully loaded pack weight that's less than 25% of your body weight. And whatever your plans are, it's always a good idea to do a shakedown hike, just a practice hike of at least three days or two nights. And if you can do it during cold and rainy weather when no one wants to come with you, <laughs> bonus points, because then you'll really know if, you're, if your gear holds up to those conditions. All right, and now you got to finally stop hearing me talk and I'm gonna pass it over to Drew. Hi everyone, so I'm Drew again, I am ATC's AT Community Program Coordinator. So I've been in touch with many of our um, towns along the trail in the past couple of weeks, and I wanna share some tips on resupply strategies 
which is given a lot of consideration in normal years. And this year especially is going to be really tricky. Um, so I'm going to be focusing on two main themes. The first is reducing the spread of disease. So you don't want to get COVID and you don't want to spread it to people in the communities you're passing through. And also there's going to be a lack of resources this year. Um, so a lot of local businesses are closed due to COVID. Catherine, next slide. So what are AT communities? This is a program through ATC. So there are designated towns along the trail that the ATC has uh, marked as being friendly to through hikers and hikers in general. So it's a network of about 50 communities um, all the way from Georgia to Maine. And we've been in touch with many of them, as I've said over the past couple of weeks to hear their concerns about this through hiking season and also what measures they've put in place to keep everyone safe and um, what is open also. Some general tips for 2021. So as I've said before, two main themes, um, we wanna reduce the spread of disease and you wanna keep in mind what's going to be open this year that may be closed. So in terms of reducing the spread of disease, you're gonna to wanna to minimize all your points of contact um, whenever you're in town. So that may mean going longer um, on the trail between resupplies. It may mean carrying five to seven days of food as opposed to two to three days of food so you don't have to go into town as often. Also, when you're in town, if you could cons consolidate your errands to as few locations as possible, maybe there's a one-stop shop as opposed to going into four or five different businesses to get all your supplies. That will help um, minimize your points of contact with the local community members. Also, if you can call ahead to order food or um, call to make sure that the post office is open before you get there, that will help you um, plan ahead and make sure that things are gonna be open and that um, you don't have to necessarily go into a restaurant to place an order, you could just stay outside. Cool, and as I mentioned before, there are going to be a lot of businesses that are closed this year. So that includes hostels, restaurants, um, community centers, public libraries. So you're gonna to wanna to call ahead to make sure that these businesses are open before you head into town. There might be things like Wi-Fi in a public library that you can't access this year. Also showers <laughs> are going to be less available, free showers. And if you're planning to walk to town, make sure that you study a map and make sure that you know where you're going and that the businesses you want to get to are as close as you think they are. More tips. Uh, adjusting your expectations this year will be important. So some things that are normally a really exciting part of through hiking, like festivals and trail magic, are not going to be as accessible this year. Um, towns are being pretty careful about festivals. Many of them are not happening or have a cap. And a lot of trail angels either are not going to be conducting trail magic along the trail and or are not going to be welcoming hikers into their house for a free stay. So those things might be missing. You're also gonna to wanna to pad your budget. So things may be more expensive this year. If you get COVID, you might have to quarantine in a hotel for a couple of weeks. Um, there are some low cost options like hostels that are not open this year. So you may have to pay more to stay in a hotel and fewer people are gonna be apt to pick up hitchhikers. So you may have to pay for transportation and call ahead for a shuttle instead of getting a free ride to town. Catherine. Yeah, and I was gonna just jump in with some, some real talk here for a couple slides to make sure everyone is aware of this because I've, I've seen some chatter of folks thinking, um, you know, I've either I've had COVID or I have been vaccinated. So anything goes, I'm ready to go hit the trail. So just wanna make sure everyone understands that if you have had the COVID-19 vaccine that only protects you from getting seriously ill. So that the science is still very much being studied um, and it's it's unknown exactly how this how great the transmission risk is, but scientists do believe that a vaccinated person may still be able to transmit the disease and they may be asymptomatic when they're doing it. 
So that's why the CDC is still asking folks to, uh, who have been vaccinated to wear masks and practice social distancing and pretty much do everything that a non-vaccinated person should do to protect others from the um, disease. Likewise, uh, previous infection with COVID-19 does not necessarily guarantee immunity. It offers some protection, but we don't really know yet how long that protection lasts or whether or not you can still, we do know that folks who have had the disease in some cases have gotten reinfected, which means that they could also transmit the disease to others. So um, just want to put that out there that, you know, even if you've had the disease already or you've been vaccinated, you still have kind of the same burden to protect others by following those um, CDC guidelines. And also a little bit of real talk about logistics. I know Drew just um, touched on this a little bit, but I've seen some folks saying, okay, shuttles are a potential, you know, high risk situation to be in a vehicle with folks outside of your household. So I'll just walk to town. There are some towns, there's some amazing communities like Hot Springs and Damascus and Harrisburg that the trail goes right through. So there are places where that is easier to do. There are also long stretches where it's extremely challenging. I um, would not want to walk into Franklin, North Carolina, for instance. I think that's what, like 12, 20 miles, I don't know, it's a long way down an extremely deep winding road with no shoulder at all. So not only is there the distance, but there's uh, the safety concerns of it not being a safe thing to do as a pedestrian. And I'll even share from, from my through hike back in 2006, which I know is ages ago, uh, I had a paper guidebook that I studied really closely when I figured out my resupply. And I thought it would be a great idea to just look for those places that were closest to the trail. So for instance, in Vermont, I uh, had a mail drop waiting for me in Killington, but I wound up, which is four miles from the trail where the trail crosses the road. So I thought I can walk four miles if I need to. But then I wound up doing, Killington is a little town sort of based around a ski resort. There's not much there. Meanwhile, the city of Rutland is the other direction and is like, I don't know, 10 or 15 miles away. So I wound up going into Rutland to get, uh, you know, to stay at a hostel and, and get, buy my groceries and get a shower and laundry and all that stuff. But I, I wound up having to go first to Killington to get my mail <laughs> and then take another ride the opposite direction to get to Rutland. And it was just, you know, so going based on just the, the sheer distance and miles from the AT of any uh, town is not, not going to give you the full picture uh, and it's not going to necessarily be the most efficient thing to do. So walking it to every town is, is probably not a great option, though it's a great idea to do it when you can. Also, I just want to say, it's obvious, but there's going to be terrible weather, and that is going to um, uh, that's going to affect how tempting things like restaurants and um, lodging situations are. So if your idea is like I will just stay out of town as much as possible, that's good, and I hope you can stick to it. But you are your your idea of how badly you need to get to town might change if you are in three or four days of solid rain and your clothes are getting all mildewy and you smell like death. And, uh, and kind of feel like it too. <laughs> they say no rain, no main for a reason. And also, of course, you can't anticipate every possible potential resupply need. So it's great to do uh, bounce boxes and mail drops and have somebody at home who has like extra gear that they could mail you so that you don't have to figure out how to get to an outfitter um, and, and that sort of thing. But there's always, every through hike comes with surprises of, you know, gear failures or or other needs that you might not be able to anticipate in advance. Okay, back to you, Drew. Thanks, so talking about transportation, uh, in a normal year, you have options like shuttles, through um, hitchhiking and trail angels picking you up. There are gonna be fewer options this year. So a lot of shuttles aren't operating. Um, you're gonna wanna call ahead to make sure that they are. And that includes trail angels. Trail angels, are, trail angels are going to be less likely to come pick you up and bring you to town and also less likely to host you in their home. Uh, fewer people are gonna wanna pick up hitchhikers for obvious reasons. And with any transportation, you're gonna wanna call ahead and ask questions about what COVID precautions they're taking in their vehicle. So while you're in the vehicle, <laughs> you're going to want to be as safe as possible. So that includes wearing a mask and asking other people to wear masks too. 
um, because they might not do it automatically. You're also gonna wanna distance as much as possible from the other passengers and the driver. So that could be putting a few people um, in the front seat and the back seat, or if you're only one in the vehicle, sit as far away from the driver as possible. And if you can keep the windows down, that is great. I had a really long two hour uh, drive last summer in the rain on the highway with all the windows down because we were afraid of COVID. And that's sometimes what you have to do <laughs> to keep safe, and to keep yourself sane. In terms of lodging, um, as I've mentioned before, a lot of low budget options are closed this year. So fewer hostels are open, um, free sites like community centers where you can usually get a shower or sleep are gonna be closed and fewer trail angels are gonna want to accept you into their home um, for free. So the most safe thing that you can do is to get a private room with a private bathroom and a private place to cook. That might mean spending a little extra money for an Airbnb or a hotel room in town. The least safe thing that you can do is to place yourself in a shared bunk room with a ton of other people. Um, risk of COVID goes up astronomically when you're in the same room as other people, especially if all of your masks are off and if you're kind of crowded in there like sardines. Um, so make sure that you're taking the precautions that are right for you and keep yourself safe. And also keep in mind that someone could be asymptomatic. And if you're in the same room as them, you can still get COVID. Food and gear, over to you, Catherine. Yeah, and we're, uh, we're bouncing back and forth just because um, Drew is an experienced hiker, but she hasn't done it, hasn't handled the logistics of a through hike yet. So <laughs> um, I know I did a, a on my AT hike and my uh, Pacific Crest Trail hike, I had a bounce box. Um, and I, I think in a normal year, it's certainly not necessary on the AT. In the end, it was just sort of a nice to have because I sent myself like nice, like I, I had a nice set of town clothes I could feel really fancy in um, but <laughs> that weren't my, my usual hiking clothes that I could do my laundry and, and wear something different. Uh, but I, I think normally a bounce box certainly isn't required. This might be a year that you want to do it. Um, a bounce box, of course, being a box that you just keep some stuff in and you mail it ahead, it bounces ahead of you and it's waiting for you when you get to the next town. Uh, once again, you can't anticipate everything that you might um, need and there's this hilarious phenomenon that happens every year of, of folks who really love to plan every detail and they send themselves food along the way and then they get so sick of that food. You know, if you, if you are kind of like, I'm just gonna make a bunch of batches of this chili and dehydrate it and I'll just eat this chili the whole way, you are probably gonna get tired of that. Um, I ate a lot of that kind of food that people left in the hiker box personally it, and worked out well for me. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's hard, hard to know, you know, what you really want to eat and what you're really going to need for a, you know, four to six month or longer journey. Um, another thing to think about with mail drops and bounce box is that uh, if you're going to mail things to the post office, you can mail things to yourself, care of general delivery at any post office and go pick it up. Uh, and post offices in AT communities are generally uh, familiar with that phenomenon. They're used to holding stuff for hikers. Do know that post offices, especially in small towns, have limited um, hours that they're open. Uh, and they're often closed on the weekends, or if they're open on Saturday, they may only be open for a few hours. So you want to know that in advance and realize that that might really cramp your style in terms of, you know, rushing, having to rush to get to town to when the post office is open, or being stuck in town for a couple of days waiting for the post office to open. Another option is there are a lot of businesses along the trail that will hold packages for hikers, sometimes for free, sometimes for a fee. Again, those are usually hostels um, and outfitters and they may or may not be open this year. So you wanna call ahead and make sure that they are open and that if they are open, they are still holding packages in the way they have in the past. Uh, so if you have a guidebook that says, you know, you can mail them a package, you don't count on that until you confirm it with the business. Talking a little bit about Meals in Town, as we mentioned, uh, great to use delivery and curbside options when available for restaurants. And um, always you know, wear a mask and follow local, local guidance um, in those uh, restaurants. And it's really great to, you know, we, do, we have this wonderful AT community partnership. We love these towns and these businesses that are such an integral part of the hiking experience um, and do so much for hikers. So we want to uh, encourage you to support those local outfitters in those small towns. Um, a lot of them have 
really knowledgeable personnel and great expertise specific to the AT that you won't find when you're shopping online from a big, you know, corporate gear company. Um, but again, may or may not be open um, at all, much less have the kind of hours and the inventory that they would have in a typical year because they've taken a hard hit um, from this these times that we're living in. So just make sure you call ahead. And if you're like, oh, I really need this specific shoe, you know, or whatever it is you're looking for, they may be able to special order it for you, but um, they might not have it if you show up as they would normally. Oh yeah, and here's my final thought. <laughs> we're gonna wrap it up and then we'll open it up to questions. I've been seeing lots of flashing lights from the chat box that I haven't gotten to read. Just really want to ask everybody, and, and I think if you signed up for this uh, session, you're probably already already have this excellent mindset. But always remember to be respectful when you're in AT communities, because you know the the way that you uh, behave is is going to affect the reputation of long distance hikers for years to come. I think be hiking, going on a long distance hike on the Appalachian Trail is an absolute privilege, and along with that privilege comes with Come some responsibility to, um, you know, give through hikers to come a good name. <laughs> and that extends to, you know, following um, the CDC guidance and being as safe as you can. Know that not everybody that you meet in an AT community knows what a through hiker is, knows what the Appalachian Trail is. They may not be speaking the same language when it comes to terms like Sobo and Nobo and, and Glashers and all that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of if you're staying per mostly at like with hostels and shuttle drivers who do uh, operate in that world, it it's easy to forget that the person you meet at the diner or the um, grocery store or whatever, it may not look at you and, and necessarily know what you're doing and what kind of journey you're on and give you that kind of respect of like somebody who's on a long distance hike. Uh, and it, you may be the first time they've ever met a through hiker. So follow the CDC guidance, wear the mask, keep that shared standard of safety, even if people around you aren't doing it, and you will reflect well on the whole hiking community. Okay, so that, that's the end of our sort of formal presentation here. And there's my email address if you wanna um, follow up with any questions, comments, anything like that. Awesome, I see a question of where do you store a bear canister uh, when you're camping at night? So. Um, just like when you hang a bear bag, it's best to store it 200 feet away, so 70 steps or so um, from your your tent because you don't want to attract the bear to where you're sleeping. Um, and then, and you know, as long as you're doing that, you can kind of put it anywhere. I kind of like to jam it under a log or something if I can, um, because that way it's a little harder for a bear to like roll it around and move it around at night. Um, maybe don't put it next to like a, a precipice that the bear could knock it off of or like a cliff or something. Not that there's a ton of campsites on the AT that are at the edge of a cliff, but um, maybe a steep ravine or something like that might be a place to avoid and not next to like a big lake or swift moving river or something because likewise it could roll away. Um, but generally that's not gonna happen. I like to have, um, mine has some like reflective tape on it because the, the one challenge of putting it far away from your tent is that it can be tricky to find in the morning, especially if you wound up stashing it in the dark. Uh, so having that reflective tape on it makes it bright yellow, pops out of the woods a little better. Stephen, you wanna take the next one? Sure, yeah, yeah we just had a couple of um, questions about bounce boxes, oatmeal. Um, real quick, um, yeah, and I, I appreciate it. Um, Jeff kind of th throws some info on bounce boxes, but yeah, bounce boxes can be different equipment as well as food that you send to yourself over and over again to different post offices, ho hostels, what, whatever you um, may be throughout the trail. If you send them to post offices, you can actually forward those if you don't open them um, without paying any other money to an additional post office. Always writing care of through hiker on it so the post office knows what's up. A lot of these trail towns are very well familiar with this system. Sometimes if you're really nice to them, you can even get them to bounce it on the phone, which means that if you decide to go to a different town and your bounce box is in a different location, they can send it to you um, in different places. I did this a couple times. They don't love to do it though so don't plan on doing that um but um i also kept a couple of different extra fun things in there for town time and or um in case of cold weather 
Yeah, and I think I could be wrong. It's worth checking on, but I believe you have to send it priority mail if you want to be able to um, bounce it ahead without paying postage again. So that's an advantage that, you know, if you find that you're there, it is expensive. It, it does have a cost with it to, to mail yourself stuff all the time. So as long as you... Um, as you don't, as long as you don't want to open it, you can walk up and just slap a new label on there and not pay to bounce it on ahead. Galaxy also asked about oatmeal packets and if you sell them individually. The answer you're looking for is to eat more oatmeal. You will need to. Yeah, I, I'm like three three packets a minimum. I mean, a box of twelve. That's just like, that's like four days. <laughs> yeah, just, just wait until you start cold soaking and you just pour a little bit of water into the packet roll the packet shut stick it in your front pocket so you can just boom goo on the road yeah i i did do my my resupply box um i i don't think i ever put oatmeal in there because like i said eat a lot of oatmeal and i was hiking with a friend so we were able to often like split a box of granola bars or whatever but there's some stuff like i remember powdered milk man i it took forever to go through like a packet of, a, or a box of powdered milk. And it's not expensive, but it was nice just to be like, your option is to like carry it or throw the rest in a, in a hiker box. Hiker boxes are um, also something that I don't know that you'll find in 2021, but in a typical year, a lot of uh, businesses, hike, hostels and, and other libraries, you know, all kinds of places in AT communities might have a box that's just free stuff for hikers. And it's usually a lot of extra food um, or like random pieces of paracord or, you know, whatever stuff somebody doesn't want to keep carrying, but another hiker might be able to make use of. Uh, so it was nice to have the bounce box on those occasions when I wanted to, um, you know, put the, put, put my extra powdered milk or whatever in there and, and it would just be waiting for me in the next town. Uh, it is, I will say like, you don't want to have too many mail drops that you share with people back home just so that you can be flexible with your plan. So anytime you've got, you've sent yourself a package or you've told other people like, hey, if you want to send me cookies, this is where you can send it. Uh, then that's a place you're going to have to go to the post office if you've sent mail to the post office. And then you're going to have to be thinking about when the post office is open and, you know, those postal holidays like Memorial Day or whatever will just sneak up on you. I want had to spend uh, three days in the tiny town of Independence, California on the PPP because I didn't realize that the 4th of July, even though it was on a Saturday, the following Monday was still a postal holiday. So <laughs> you gotta, you gotta think about those things if you're gonna mail yourself food to, um, or anything at all, ask other people to mail you fund their packages to a post office. Uh, that, that's just gonna limit your flexibility in terms of where you wanna resupply as you go. Thank you all so much for, for taking that extra step to do your planning and happy hiking whenever you get out there.